So over the last 70 years or so, we haven't just seen a change in our diets. We've also seen a huge change in the diets of livestock, which we then consume. You are what you eat eats. So in this video, let's review the fatty acid tests of our low PUFA chicken here at Nourish. And in case you're new here, my name is Ashley, otherwise known as Farmer Ash. And I actually have a PhD in mechanical engineering, but I decided to take a little bit of an unconventional path. So I instead became a first generation farmer and I am a human health first farmer and I am very obsessed with human metabolism and the impact that dietary fatty acids have on our metabolic rate. So the team of us here at Nourish are on a mission to create an alternative food system that supports our health, unlike the conventional food system that fights against us. So us and the members of Nourish Food Club, together we are building an alternative food system together. Pretty cool, right? So make sure you hit the like and subscribe button to follow along this journey. So in this video, we'll start with a brief review of why you would want to keep your PUFA intake and your linoleic acid intake low how the conventional food system has really changed the diets of livestock, which impacts the types of fat that we consume dietarily. And then of course, I'll review the fatty acid tests on our low PUFA chicken. So as I've discussed in a number of other videos, the health consequences of elevated PUFA intake is vast. So first, higher PUFA diets impair energy production, meaning you will have down-regulated systemic energy production so functions will be down-regulated in the body and you will experience more fatigue. Second, higher PUFA diets increase insulin resistance since PUFAs block proper carb metabolism. Third, higher PUFA diets will wreck your gut since they increase tight junction permeability along the gut lining leading to leaky gut and they alter the gut microbiome which will induce dysbiosis. Fourth, increased risk of NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, since PUFAs drive inflammation in the liver. Fifth, contribute to hormonal imbalances and estrogen dominance, which we are seeing a lot more of these days, since PUFAs damage our natural estrogen detoxification pathway. Next up, PUFAs accelerate aging due to increased rates of oxidative damage, since guys, PUFAs are unstable molecules. So excess linoleic acid and omega-6 PUFA leads to the formation of oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, OXLANs, which are associated with various chronic illnesses, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. PUFAs also decrease cognitive function and increase inflammation in the brain, and a higher PUFA diet will change the internal environment and makeup inside of us. And this is because the types of fat that we consume dietarily impacts the types of fat inside of us, which then impacts metabolic signaling and metabolic processes inside of us. So we are now much more unsaturated relative to our great, great grandparents and mother's milk now contains more linoleic acid, more omega-6 PUFAs impacting the makeup of the next generation right at the start. So historically, linoleic acid and omega-6 PUFA made up only 1-2% to of our ancestors' daily calories. Today, some estimates are that linoleic acid makes up 15-25% to of total calories due to this huge change in the food system. So a large increase in the exposure and intake of seed oils, which are rich in omega-6, has nearly tripled the amount of linoleic acid in our diets. So seed oils are common cooking oils in restaurants, fast food joints. Seed oils are also in most fat-based products like salad dressing and mayo. They're also snuck into most packaged food like tortilla chips, crackers, bars, microwave dinners, really anything in a package because these are cheap government subsidized ingredients, right? However, another big source of dietary linoleic acid is conventional chicken which Americans have drastically increased their consumption of. So here's a plot from the USDA. You can see this yellow line is chicken consumption, and it used to be a smaller percentage of our diet. Now fast forward to today when we're told that saturated fat and red meat is bad for us, chicken makes up a lot more of our diet. And there's been another change that isn't shown in this plot, but as the years go on, that chicken is becoming more and more unsaturated, more 
contains more PUFA due to change in the chicken's diet. In fact, some estimates of dietary intake claim that the highest source of linoleic acid in the American diet today is actually chicken meat. Of course, from confinement or eating a crappy diet, but this plot here, this chart is from Tucker Goodrich, where he lists the top sources of omega-6 linoleic acid of the American diet, which he gathered from the NIH website. And you can see chicken ranks number one. It didn't used to be this way. I know it's all that we know right now because we were born into this, but I've studied like the old school agricultural systems and it was totally different back then. The food system has changed with the drastic ramp up in corn and soy crop production after World War II. So most livestock diets now contain high poof ingredients like corn, soy, and vegetable oil. In fact, the majority of U.S. corn and soy produced in the U.S. is not directly consumed by humans and is produced for livestock feed. However, there is a new player into the feed game that no one is talking about, and it is pretty horrible. So it's called DDGS. So the emergence of the ethanol as fuel industry in the early 2000s created a new inexpensive and widely, widely available feed ingredient that is very high in PUFAs, and that is dried distillers grains with solubles, DDGS. And so the, this is produced as a byproduct of ethanol production, and it's a cost-effective, high oil, high PUFA ingredient used primarily in livestock feeds. So corn is the main thing used to produce ethanol. And so this ethanol production involves fermenting the starch in corn to produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. So then the ethanol is then separated and purified and used for you know biofuel and other applications. And then what remains is the protein, fiber, fat, and minerals that was in the corn. But these are now concentrated, dried, and sold as DDGS. So corn is actually very high in starch and contains relatively lower amounts of protein and fat. But that starch, remember, is removed for ethanol production. And so when you have DDGS, you're left with much more higher concentrated levels of the fat that was in corn. So DDGS has more fat and more PUFAs relative to raw corn. It also contains high levels of toxic agrochemicals since most GMO corn used in ethanol production is heavily treated with herbicides, insecticides, or fungicides such as glyphosate and atrazine. And so these pesticides become concentrated in DDGS during production because as the starch is removed, the other components are richer in those toxic residues. And so studies confirm that pesticide levels in the DDGS component are higher than in the original grain, obviously posing potential risks for livestock, humans, and then obviously environmental health as well. So DDGS is now unfortunately widely used in livestock feeds today because it is a cheap byproduct of ethanol production. Price estimates that it is below 10 cents a pound, and this is a cheap feed ingredient that now, on one hand, it does provide some valuable protein and fiber for the livestock, but it also brings along with that a lot of PUFAs and pesticides. So Tyson Foods, you may have heard of them. They are the largest ch chicken producer here in the U.S., and they process approximately 45 million chickens weekly. That's insane. Tyson Foods has incorporated DDGS into its poultry feed formulations since 2004. And I found a report saying that by 2010, the company was already ramped up to 700,000 metric tons of DDGS annually across its feed mills. So that was just from 2004 to 2010. Imagine how much it's using today in 2024. So here's the macro composition, the breakdown of DDGS. Like I said, it does contain some valuable protein, 25 to 30% but it also does contain quite a bit of fat, anywhere between eight to 12%, and 70% of that fat is unsaturated. It also provides some fiber, some carbs, and it's an overall very energy dense feed ingredient. Now, on top of this, so DDGS is a byproduct of ethanol. Well, a byproduct of you know fast food restaurants is used fryer oil. Well, some people are using used fryer oil in chicken feed and used fryer oil is well known to contain 
very high levels of toxic aldehydes, toxic lipid oxidation products such as 4-HNE due to the high temperatures that those PUFAs are exposed to during frying. And again, PUFAs are unstable and they'll break down, oxidize at those higher temperatures. So then the chickens are consuming higher levels of these toxic uh, aldehydes, toxic lipid oxidation breakdown products. Now, the consequence of this change in livestock feed is that chickens are now consuming more PUFAs relative to what they were consuming back in the early 1900s. And it is very well established that when a chicken eats more PUFAs in their diet, there's more PUFA deposited in their own fat, which we then consume. So exposing us to higher levels of PUFAs as well. So chickens are vehicles for vegetable oils, vehicles for high PUFA feed ingredients. And many of the conventional chicken barns, conventional chicken products, they're able to keep the price so low of these, of these products, like chicken at the grocery store can be priced very low because they're using cheap byproducts, for example, DDGS, and they're using government subsidized crops, making the price of conventional feed very, very low. But that obviously comes with the cost of quality. So our feed ingredients here at Nourish, uh, specifically designed to be low in PUFA, and our ingredients are not government subsidized. So our feed costs are significantly higher. For example, Vital Farms feed for egg production, our feed is five times the cost of that. So we, our input costs are just higher and we're trying to maximize quality. So let's see what happens to the fatty acid profile when chickens are fed a low PUFA diet like we do here at Nourish. So I sent in chicken thighs from Nourish and then a generic organic free range chicken thigh from the grocery store. However, it's important to note that organic chicken are still fed corn and soy and organic corn and soy still have the same amount of PUFAs as non-organic corn and soy. Now you would expect this to be like a good option because you know, organic and free range. In this table, I also include some data that I found for chickens that were fed DDGS in CAFO barns, such as what is done at Tyson. So let's first look at the linoleic acid content per 100 grams of chicken thigh. So at Nourish, we have 0.063 grams. The organic free range is higher at 0.861 grams of linoleic acid and the DDGS fed varied from 2.66 to 3.1, depending on the amount of DDGS in the feed. So at 10% inclusion rate, the linoleic acid content was 2.66. And then at 20% feed inclusion rate, the linoleic acid content was 3.1. So with nourished chicken thighs, that is a 92.67% decrease from, of linoleic acid from the organic free range chicken thighs. Now, as a note, there will be different amounts of fat on 100 grams of chicken thigh, depending on how the butcher cuts the thigh and how much fat is left on the thigh, right? So this is why it is important to look at the percentage of total fat. So the total linoleic acid content that you then consume will then scale up or down based on this percentage, depending on the fat content of the chicken cut that you're consuming. So we want a lower linoleic acid percentage. Nourish has the lowest linoleic acid con percentage of the fat relative to the other options on this table. And finally, let's look at the stearic acid to linoleic acid ratio. I think this is super important to consider because the ratios of different fatty acids in your diet will send different metabolic signals to the body. So stearic acid is a very pro-metabolic saturated fatty acid that supports metabolism and energy production. So we want more stearic acid relative to linoleic acid. Now on the flip side with more linoleic acid and more PUFAs, this sends a hibernation torpor-like signal to the body, which will lead to down regulation of the metabolism. So think of what happens to squirrels when they increase their nut consumption. Nuts are higher in PUFAs and they do this to lower their metabolic rate as they head into winter to enter hibernation. So at Nourish, we have a much more ideal stearic acid to linoleic acid ratio 1.84 whereas the organic free range in the DDGS fed chicken have a lot more linoleic acid and a lower stearic acid to linoleic acid ratio. Again, those two values send a very different metabolic signal to the body. As a note, you'll see that I did not do omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. I don't think that that's something that is as valuable as the stearic acid to linoleic acid ratio because we can't just consume high omega-6 and try to mask that with more and more omega-3. 
Omega-3 are also PUFAs and they're unstable and we don't need to over consume them because that will lead to more oxidation. Now, I'm not saying that you don't, you're going to be able to avoid PUFAs. That's impossible. They, even if they are quote essential, you're going to get them naturally in your diet. You can't avoid them. What we're trying to do is produce food that's more natural to what our ancestors were consuming. So rather than just ramping up the omega-3, that's not really natural each either, right? We're trying to keep the PUFA content lower and keep saturated fat a little bit higher. So finally, let's look at some pie charts comparing the fatty acid breakdown. So the percentage of the saturated fat, percentage of MUFA, and percentage of PUFA. So at Nourish, on the left, the saturated fatty acid content is the highest, which is the blue part of the pie chart, which is what we want. And we have the lowest PUFA percentage that's in green. The organic free range and the DDGS chickens is almost split one third, one third, one third with less saturated fat and more PUFA relative to nourish, which is not what we want. So that about wraps up this video. The only way to get more PUFAs in your body is through your diet since you cannot make them. That's why people say they are quote essential. So your serum and your adipose tissue levels of PUFAs correlate with your dietary consumption. A study found that reducing linoleic acid intakes from 6.7% down to 2.2% resulted in significantly reduced levels of harmful linoleic acid byproducts in plasma in 12 weeks or less. So lowering your PUFA intake will improve health metrics. Now, as a note, it does take about two years for you to change the fatty acid composition inside of you. So that's why it's important to be consistent with a lower PUFA diet over time. So that way your body can resaturate your tissue store. So we can return back to what our great, great grandparents were kind of made up like, right? Now, again, I'm going to really harp on this point. You will never be able to consume zero PUFA and that's not possible. All foods contain some amount of them, but here at Nourish, we're trying to produce food with less linoleic acid so that you can consume more natural levels of PUFAs in your diet closer to what our ancestors were consuming. Remember, the conventional food system has drastically changed the fatty acid composition of our diets and the fatty acid composition of livestock as well. We're just trying to go back to how food used to be produced so that you can then consume more ancestrally appropriate levels of linoleic acid and PUFA. So... The conventional food system has drastically changed our dietary fat sources and has increased our PUFA consumption dramatically through seed oils, confinement chicken, and confinement pork, confinement eggs. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. Until next time, stay nourished, stay saturated.